let me tell you what, this is a different group of people than I was in charge of during the Saturday. Dr. Ruth knows where I was on Saturday. On Saturday, I was inside Phillips State Prison in Buford, Georgia. I was ministering to the residents at the time. When I had a table, I was in charge of a table of eight residents. In Phillips State Prison, that's eight felons that committed everything from armed robbery to murder, multiple murders, and I got to deal with them for a full day uh, on Saturday. So, being with this group, it's a nice change. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to present basically what I presented before uh, on the Suwannee Satella Council. I'll have some new information at the end of my talk about a model that they're doing in Florida that, you know, involves this area, will involve this area. You can see the footprint in Florida. That's what I'm going to do. So if you recall what I presented the last time, a lot of this is the same. Okay, now I'm going to give an overview of the sustainable yield modeling results. I'm going to tell you the process that we use to model the sustainable yield. And I'm going to give you the sustainable yield results for the aquifers in the region. Now, state of Georgia, showing the various aquifers. Here's the Suwannee Citella Council right here. You've got a little bit of the Brunswick Aquifer here. You mostly have the Florida Aquifer. The light blue is the Florida Aquifer. In the state of Georgia, we also have the Claiborne and Clayton Aquifers down here in southwest Georgia. We have the uh, Gordon Aquifer system in east Georgia. We have the Cajun Aquifer right here. That is the coastal plain. The coastal plain of Georgia is a line that runs from about Columbus to about Macon up to Augusta. Everything below is the coastal plain deposit. So all the Florida aquifer, the Paleozoic, the Gordon, the Cretaceous, and the Flavor are all the coastal plain aquifer. North of the fall line, we have the crystalline rock aquifer. It's solid rock, and where it's fractured, that's where the permeability is. If you drill a well into a fracture, you might get, this is a high yield for crystal aquifer rock, 100 gallons a minute. That's with a high yield. If you don't, if you don't get it in the fracture, you're liable to get a half a gallon. In northwest Georgia, the 10 counties in northwest Georgia, we get back to integrated sedimentary rocks, limestone and such. So I'm going to talk for the most part about the coastal part. Now, what we did to do the modeling, the sustainable yield is the amount of groundwater withdrawn, withdrawn from the aquifer without causing an unwanted result. We used a numerical models to uh, model that, so we had to actually say what an unwanted result was. So we had to put the numbers, and I'll tell you what the numbers are. The sustainable yield metrics were selected to determine, to determine if simulated withdrawals would cause the unwanted results. One of the unwanted results was the amount of drawdown. If the amount of drawdown exceeded 30 feet between the wells, that was too much. If, it was, if the drawdown was less than 30 feet, that was okay, that we could draw some more and get the sustainable yield. But once we got 30 feet of drawdown, that was our sustainable yield. The sustainable yield metrics were different for different aquifers, and I'll explain a little bit about how that works. And that sustainable, different sustainable yield metrics would result in different sustainable yields. Now, if I said the sustainable yield was what I could pump and get no more than 30 feet of drawdown, that would be different than if I said I want to pump and get no, no more than 10 feet of drawdown, which would be different if I said this is what I want to pump and 
I would allow 50 feet of drive. So we decided on 30 feet of drive, but it'd be different at 10 and different at 50. Okay, sustainable yield. This is something that the USGS done that I, I think is pretty good. You have a groundwater system. This is pre-developed, no pumping from the aquifer. You have a certain amount of recharge into the aquifer. You've got a certain amount of discharge from the aquifer. And here's the aquifer system. We take the aquifer system and we pump it. We remove the removal of water stored in the aquifer system. So we're pumping it. And it's the same deal. When we do that, we increase, actually increase, the recharge to the aquifer because we're lowering the hydraulic head, we're increasing the hydraulic gradient across the boundary, so we actually increase the amount of recharge, but we also decrease the amount of discharge. That's the aquifer condition during development. So the, the, the question we have to ask ourselves, does an increasing recharge, removal of water stored in the system, or a decrease in discharge cause an unwanted result. For example, uh, the discharge, maybe that's the, the groundwater discharge into a stream, what's called the base flow. We pump the aquifer, we decrease the discharge to the stream. So we decrease the base flow. That was also a metric that we used. We had a metric uh, in certain of the aquifers. We didn't want the uh, decrease the base flow, not the total flow, but the base flow by more than 40%. And some of the aquifers in the coastal plain, that was what drove the sustainable yield. This you know, the, uh, de uh, decrease in the base flow. For other aquifers, it was the drawdown. So as I said, Different, aqua, different metrics came into play for different aquifers. Okay. Uh, overall, we uh, when we did the when we did the state water plan in Georgia, we prioritized the aquifers that we did the uh, state water plan for. We didn't do a, 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 a sustainable yield for each and every aquifer in the state because that was a budget constraint. We didn't have enough money to do that, but we prioritized it. Most of the aquifers, we pick three or four aquifers within the coastal plain, and we pick the Dowry Plain, Upper Florida Aquifer in Southwest Georgia. Most of the work was done in the coastal plain. So that's really where the big aquifers are. We did do a sustainable yield for a portion of the Paleozoic Rock Aquifer in Northwest Georgia. And we did do a water balance approach for two areas of the crystalline rock aquifer in, in Georgia. So we didn't ignore the northern part of the state, but I have to say that a lion's share of the modeling that we did was down in the coastal plain because we have so much groundwater uses in the coastal plain. Okay. The sustainable yield, this was, was this, these are a summary of the results. An overview of the sustainable yield. We found that the safe, sustainable yield for the upper Florida aquifer in south central Georgia, and I'll show you what we define as south central Georgia, is higher than the baseline current withdrawals. Now, this was the baseline withdrawals back when we started the sustainable yield back in 2008. So the withdrawals now are probably higher than they were in 2008, but I suspect the sustainable yield that we determined by the modeling is still higher than the baseline <coughs> current withdrawals. And the sustainable yield for the upper Florida and aquifer in south central Georgia <coughs> and the eastern coastal plain withdrawing together is higher than the baseline current withdrawals. Again, that looking back to a 2008 baseline, but I don't think the baseline in 2015, if it's as projected, it's a little bit higher, but it still does not approach the sustainable ego. So the statement that the current withdrawals, I don't know what the current withdrawals are, but the sustainable ego is probably higher than the current withdrawals. Okay. 
So these, these are the postal plane aquifers that we're in. And I'll talk, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to talk about. We did the Claiborne aquifer right in here. We also did the Clayton aquifer. Before, after this slide was made, we did the Clayton aquifer right in here also. We looked at the Cretaceous aquifer between Macon and Augusta. So we looked at this the Cretaceous aquifer. Then what we did now, this not on the slide, we also looked at the uh, upper Florida aquifer and the Gory Plain, but we used a different model for that purpose. We used the current USGS model for that purpose. This does not uh, offer that, that particular model. And then we looked at the upper Florida aquifer in South Central Georgia, which is this area right in here. That's the South Central Georgia. <coughs> and we looked at the upper aquifer, the upper Florida aquifer in the eastern coastal plain, which is right about here. So your region is right down here. We're mostly in South Central Georgia. A little bit of the region is in, is in the eastern coastal plain. Baselines for sustainable yield modeling were estimated for actual current withdrawals, not permanent capacities. We actually estimated how much the current withdrawals were. If the, you know, I, a lot of times uh, the agricultural wells are permitted at 1,000 gallons per minute. And as I say to people, as I've said to people for years, if a farmer were to go out and pump 1,000 gallons per minute, on the field 24 hours a day, you know, for all during the irrigation season, he can have about 20 feet of water on his field. And, you know, and that way we wouldn't have to worry about the farmer irrigating next year because he'd be out of business because he didn't bring in a crop this year. So the, the permitted amounts are different than the actual usage. So the, the current withdrawals are what our estimate of the actual, actual usage. Uh, municipal and industrial withdrawals were obtained from data reported to EPD by the permittee, because that's a requirement. That's a permit requirement for them. So that's how we got the uh, municipal and industrial. The permitted and domestic commercial, unpermitted domestic and commercial withdrawals were estimated to have been about 12% of the total statewide uh, groundwater data in 2005 were taken from the USGS data. That's their estimate of what the unpermitted withdrawal, you know, if a well yields less than 100,000 gallons per day, essentially less than 70 gallons a minute, which is going to be your permanent, your, your domestic wells, okay, that's not reported to the state, so we don't have data. So we estimate that there's about 12% of withdrawal. And in the agricultural world, we're using a combination of USGS, the Georgia EV data and the 2004 ag water pumping study. But did we have um, some of the meter data in the actual? Uh, we didn't use the meter data at the time because we didn't have a data set that was robust enough to use during the first time. What we did use from the commission was the, sor uh, the sources or the type, groundwater, surface water, and the locations of the withdrawals. But we didn't use the data because it just wasn't a robust enough data set. Yes. Um, estimated it based on crop type. And, and now we're getting those data now. Correct. We're going back and going back and looking at this again. So we didn't have it at the time, but we're getting it. Okay. Increased withdrawals from existing wells and individual prioritized options. This is the model simulations we use to determine the sustainable yield. So the first thing we did, let's get a lower end of the sustainable yield by increasing withdrawals from existing wells and individualized, prioritized options. That would you know, give us a lower end of the sustainable yield. If we have an existing well, we, we modeled it and we simulated we increased the withdrawal from the existing wells. Then what we did, we increased the withdrawals from the existing wells and hypothetical new wells in the prioritized aquifer. These 
have portions of aquifers that were not fully developed and could then they can install more wells in an area and get to a more sustainable yield there. So that gave us an upper end of the sustainable yield is existing wells and hypothetical new wells. You don't have a well there now, but if you put a well in, if you put a well in, in, in the future, perhaps you can get more water in. So that determines the ranges of aquifer sustainable yields, the upper range, lower range, and the upper range. Then we simultaneously increase the withdrawals from the existing wells in all prioritized aquifers in the regional model. One of the things we found that, and I'll have a slide about this later, that the aquifers are interconnected. If you go uh, to the Cretaceous aquifer, which is the deepest aquifer, and you pump the Cretaceous aquifer, you get a lot of drawdown. You'll get some drawdown in the Cretaceous aquifer. But then you'll also get some drawdown in the overlying Clayton, overlying Clayburn, and overlying Florida aquifer. And we showed this, and I'll show a slide about this. So, you know, pumping from the Cretaceous does affect the water levels in all of the other aquifers. So we consider that also as if we increasing all of the aquifers by themselves, but then we increase all of the aquifers together to see how that changes the sustainable yield. And there was a difference, a slight difference, but there was a difference. Okay. So the sustainable yield metrics. The first <coughs> thing was drop the ground groundwater levels in the pump, pump aquifer do not exceed 30 feet between the pumping walls. That's that was the major metric that came into play. Not for all the aquifers, but it was a major metric. Two, the recharge from surface water resources is constrained to 40% of the base flow that 40% uh, actually uh, applies to the total flow, but we apply the base flow in order to make opportunities for surface water use. A couple of times that came into play. We didn't want to decrease the dis discharge to the streams. Then we had other things. Reduction in aquifer storage does not go beyond a new base level. That didn't come into play, and I'll explain what that means. Uh, another thing, groundwater levels were not lowered below the top of the confined aquifer. That would change the confined aquifer to an unconfined aquifer, and it would change the way the aquifer uh, operated, so it was operated. And then the ability of the aquifer to recover the baseline groundwater levels between periods of higher pumping during the drought is not exceeded. So we, we checked each one of these things. Now, as I said, here's a well. We increase the pumping, simulated. Here's a well we increase the pumping. We don't want the drawdown in between the two wells, the line, the line drawdown between the wells. We didn't want that to exceed 30 feet. It wasn't the pumping and the drawdown at the well, it was a drawdown between the wells, did not exceed 30 feet. So that was one metric. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.